uh so so most of this work uh, that 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 i've been talking about is stuff that i've been doing for the last i don't know nearly you know 7 8 years so part of it was most most of it was done uh at caltech and towards the end those are stuff done uh with my collaborators over at arizona as well as uh, at mit i've started at mit only a little over 2 years ago and uh, in case you guys didn't notice last year has been uh uh interesting so starting a new lab from scratch during in the, in, in middle of covid has been an interesting experience in and of itself so anyway so so what i'm going to be talking about is dna origami bridge from top to bottom but before i get into the thick of things and like get started with all the results i want to kind of contextualize what it is that i'm going to be talking about to, to kind of uh, set the stage so to speak so um the first thing that is that one needs to kind of understand is what do i mean by top down fabrication and what do i mean by bottom up fabrication it's important to actually understand that and uh, uh, to understand what i mean by uh, bridge from top to bottom so top down nano fabrication is the way in which everything around us is constructed basically anything that is not biological or uh, that you see in nature is constructed by something top down uh, some top down nano fabrication and this is just an example a canonical example of what can be created with top down nano fabrication so this is the cross section of an a2 a4 chip uh that was there in one of the earlier iPhones and on the bottom you have the silicon layer and these little gray spaces that you have gray gray features that would be the gates of different transistors and then a whole bunch of other layers on top of it a lot can be said about the size of these different features and you know that's what moore's law is and you know how small you can create these structures i'm not focusing on that what i am more interested in is the fact that once you construct something on a surface and you know where it is you can register with respect to that particular feature multiple other structures so in this particular uh, chip there are about 2000 200 between 200 and 400 different layers 200 or 400 different processes were done patterns were done with respect to features on that were defined on the surface so you have something on a surface and you're building a whole bunch of other stuff around it so once you know where something is there located with respect to that particular feature you can do a extraordinarily high uh, uh, controlled fabrication and everything in that particular picture was constructed by one of these three methods by repeated uh, uh, uh application of this particular space, surface uh, uh, fee, uh these one of these three processes you pattern it and then you either deposit a material you etch a material or you dope it you change the material characteristics and by repeated application of it you construct this 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 set of this entire stack on silicon and that is how you create all the microelectronics there are details there are uh, different chemistries and different amount of tricks one needs to play to get very small features and different materials and things like that we are not going to go into that that's that encompasses what is top down just generally encompasses what is top down nanofabrication and the same philosophy can be used to construct micro uh, microfluidic devices where you have you control the flow of uh, fluids uh you can do uh, optical devices where you control sort of flow of electrons uh you can also have microelectromechanical systems where you take mechanical structures sort of like a gyroscope and reimagine it on a nanoscale or microscale on silicon to to get accelerometers and gyroscopes that you find all the time inside your uh iPhones and uh, whatever phone that you have so that's top down nano fabrication on the other end of the spectrum you have bottom up nano fabrication which is basically everything that is not top down which is not artificially constructed falls into this bottom up fabrication wherein you have in an abstract setting you have a bunch of atoms or a bunch of molecules coming together let's call it self assembly process this could be just heating and cooling it could be electro uh, like chemical setup or you are changing the electronic conditions uh, and it will basically come together to form a particular structure like for instance everything that you see around you in biology is some kind of biomolecular structure wherein you have proteins that come together to form larger protein structures or the other example would be quantum dots where you have semiconductor uh, molecules that come together to form a nanoparticle of a certain shape and certain crystallinity that gives it certain kind of optical properties you have carbon nanotubes 
the uh, examples are endless in, in, in within the bottom up nanofabrication world and within this context i like to imagine that the question that my lab loves to actually ask or part of the question that like my, that drives my lab is what will integrated integrated chips look like in 30 years so this is a particular picture this is a, a mems a microphone that you have or some version of it would be there in many of the uh, in your many of the cell phones in the middle you have a diaphragm and a whole bunch of electronics around it so diaphragm acts as like the mic and it vibrates and then you it converts it into electrical signal and then does everything else so what will integrated chips look like in like 20 30 years i think that it's going to look very similar to this except that you might end up having like nanowires positioned to create some kind of a logic that performs much faster much quicker things like that you might have like sing like biomolecules sitting on the diaphragm so that when you are speaking into it it's also doing some kind of biosensing to tell what is the what are the molecules in your breath so uh, or you might end up having like single quantum dots or single atoms sitting inside these kind of exquisite structures to doing uh, to encode the information um, uh, to do quantum information processing and uh, like uh, encrypt it and send it off uh, rather than the encryptions that we are using right now now this seems kind of futuristic but the reality is parts of this these these constructs or these structure these, these these kind of devices are already being constructed specifically you have nanowires being connected together to form uh, electronic devices you do have optical devices wherein you have single quantum dots or single emitters positioned inside resonators to give it like interesting quantum optical properties you have biosensors wherein you have single molecules or single biomolecules interacting with single uh, optical devices and you're integrating it one at a time in in fact, on the right rightmost column, you have uh, this biosensor, which is part of uh, Pacific Biosciences uh, sequencing platform, wherein you have a single biological uh, protein, a polymerase, sitting inside an optical device. And as it's processing the DNA, you are reading out what it is processing. So it is used for doing sequencing. So that's actually commercially available. Now, the problem with these hybrid nano devices, wherein you have top down devices, and bottom-up components kind of connected to each other. The problem is, how do you construct it? The problem is, you know, they are that, that, and and that's where interesting interesting properties starts happening. So the, the 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 electronic device over on the top left, this was constructed by a process that let's call it hunt and pick. What you do is you take down take the bottom-up components, throw it down on a surface, literally just incubate it. You just position them randomly, find out one of them, and create contacts and write a paper. Or the second one is scanning probe assembly, wherein you construct exquisite optical devices, take bottom-up components, take a small little tip like an AFM or a scanning probe, move the component into position and then study it uh, for a certain purpose. Or the last one is spray and pray, wherein you basically make an exquisite device and then you just basically throw down your molecules and hope that one of them goes and sits exactly where you want. If you get two that can't be used. If you have nothing, you can't use it. You want just a single molecule sitting exactly where you want within these kind of ex these nano devices so that it can be utilized. So as you can imagine, none of this is scalable. None of them is mo are, are modular. What I mean by scalable is you can't construct billions of devices and make sure that their properties are all identical. None of them are modular. What by that, whatever you learn from one of these processes, you can't apply it to something else. So there's a fundamental problem there. And it is, in the, it is in this context that we ask this question. And I think that some version of this is going to become a reality because the opportunities are just too much here. Like uh, this kind of integrated systems wherein you have bottom-up structures and top-down devices kind of merging. There are a lot of interesting questions to be done, not just physics, not just fundamental questions, but applications as well are there. So some version of this is going to be a reality. And this is the quick and, 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 and so my lab are, likes to ask, to ask two questions. One is how do we actually achieve this integration? Like how do we actually integrate bottom up atomically precise components, whether it is a single molecule, single quantum dot, single atom, single ion, integrate that with top down devices that we know how to construct. How do you actually merge that? And the second question, which I won't talk about much uh, in this particular talk, is uh, you know what are the functional devices and what are the fundamental questions that you can start asking once you create this capability?
so that's setting the setting the stage of what i'm trying to work on and my tool of choice or my material of choice to achieve this is dna but before i go into dna i want to kind of give a very brief introduction for those who don't know about dna like what is dna and and everything that i'm talking about uh, as far as uh, dna here uh, uh, is views the dna as a we view dna as a polymer we don't use it at least in the context of this presentation we are not using it as a for its biological properties we are using it purely from a, for its polymeric properties so from that context the structure of dna it looks sort of like this it is it's, it's it, you can think of it as a cylinder uh, with two uh, that is 2 nanometers in diameter and it has two parts to it you have one strand think of it as one thread and another thread that is basically intertwined and uh, on each of the uh, the, the, the backbone of the thread is made out of phosphate and uh, there are a, and so it has certain directionality so you have a phosphate you have a sugar a phosphate sugar and wherever and so there is a directionality to it and on that phosphate backbone you have one of four different decorations you have adenine thymine guanine and cytosine so think of it as two four molecules four types of molecules that you are kind of decorating on a single thread and the distance between the two uh, any two adjacent uh, molecules are going to be about 3.4 angstroms or 0.34 nanometers and adenine likes to interact with thymine guanine likes to interact with cytosine so in this context you can take one of these dna strands it's a single strand of dna you can represent it as a straight line you give it an arrow because there is this directionality and then you can put it you can enumerate it with atgc so you have so that that gives you the representation of a single strand of dna and once you have a single strand of dna you will always have another strand which is in the other direction where the arrow is pointing in the other direction which means that the phosphate and the sugar the the sequences are in the other direction and wherever you have a in one you have t in the other the vice versa and wherever you have c in one you have g in the other that is complementarity adenine likes to interact with thymine guanine likes to interact with cytosine and this is about all that you need to know to understand the rest of the uh, talk so this like forget about all the biology and all that stuff you just need to think of it as a polymer which in which you have this kind of directionality and this just and and you have atgc that's about all you need to know so dna nanotechnology this idea started in the mid 80s or like early 80s by net seaman who was at uh, nyu wherein he asked the question if you take a single strand of dna that has two set two parts to it to abstract two parts of it the first half uh, the, the the one of the halves of the first strand interacts with the second uh, half of a second strand the second half of the second strand interacts with the first half of a third strand and the second half of the third strand interacts with the first half of the first strand so essentially it forms this kind of abstract cross and this there's nothing like this the, like from a just base pairing interaction what what i mean by atgc you can create these kind of molecules these four molecules and then he asked the question if you take this abstract cross and if you had short sections on each of the ends such that the top likes to interact with the bottom and the right half interacts to the left half what happens he proposed that if you make this it will for if you if you were to create the structure it will tile and create this kind of extended crystalline lattice at least that was a proposal and after a few years people started actually creating this you can create these kind of mesh kind of a structure wherein you have single strands a single strand of dna is about 2 nanometers and that's what they were trying to construct and and experimentally it was explored and there were several papers that played on the themes and variations of this you can form extended structures you can make uh, other kind this is a hex square lattice or a hexagonal lattice you can even do computation here but it's not important i mean but the but the point is to create extended lattices uh, wherein you're treating dna as a polymer that you can engineer and you can create materials out of it and for nearly two decades from the mid 80s or early 80s to mid 2000s this was the theme and variation of what made dna nanotechnology and in uh, mid 2000s somewhere around 2004 2005 the concept of dna origami came to the front and the idea of dna origami is where you take a long strand of a uh, genomic dna which is basically the single stranded a single stranded uh, um genome of a virus that infects e coli it's called m13 mp18 it's 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 single stranded uh, genome is about 7300 bases 7250 bases long and you know the exact sequence you know exactly where atgc what the sequence is of this long thread the idea was to the idea that uh, paul proposed was to take a whole bunch of short dna strands and put it together such that it will take different parts of this long strand pull it together 
and fold it into a particular shape. And that was the idea of DNA origami. And I will go into a little bit more detail uh, uh, a few slides down, but this is the idea of DNA origami. And if you were to take um, uh, uh, animation of this process. This is by uh, courtesy uh, Sean Douglas, who's at UCSF. But uh, this is not a simulation. This is merely an animation. So you have a long strand of DNA uh, of scaffold. Here you go. This, these are the scaffolds. And uh, these are all the staples. You will observe that the staples, because of its sequences, will go and find its own location on this long scaffold and bring different location, different parts of this long scaffold closer to each other. So uh, if you continue with the uh, animation, this you, you see that as, as, as it's forming, as you mix all these structures together, the scaffold will fold into a particular shape because the staples will staple different locations to each other. It will, because of its sequences, it will find its own different locations and fold it into a particular shape of your choosing. In some vague way, you can think of it sort of like a knitting, just like how you're making these kind of cross patterns in a in a long thread, you find these knots. You, the, uh, uh, here, the knots are being constructed by short DNA strands, and the long DNA strand, a single long DNA strand, creates like the skeleton of the structure. It's not exactly like knitting, but it can help you kind of think about. So it's, if you want to go into a little bit more detail, let's actually go into the exercise of designing a DNA origami. Let's say you want to make this kind of a triangular structure. What you would do is, depending upon the, the, shape and the, the shape and the length and all of that, you will take this triangular structure and then you will raster through this entire uh, shape. This is 2D. You could do this even in 3D, except that if you're doing it in 3D, you need to raster it in 3D. And I didn't represent it because it's kind of harder to observe rastering in three dimensions. So in two dimensions, you would raster through this entire surface, entire shape. And then you will abstractly represent, you'll start enumerating this, this single raster represents that long the, uh, scaffold long genome of the virus and you know the exact sequence of the of the of that particular genome so you will put it as atgc something then when you know the sequence you know exactly what it is once you have that you can start asking which shorter dna strands you should have to hold the structure because the structure will not be held together because there is no reason for it to sh stay in the shape. However, if you have short staples, you can think of short DNA strands that are complementary, the second strand that is always part of a double-stranded DNA, and the sequence that finds different locations and bring them closer to each other. So that's the general idea of designing a DNA origami. And then, and, uh, then what you do is you'll enumerate all of that. Each different uh, dot in this particular map represents a particular molecule. And then you will, uh, you know, you'll send it out to IDT or a particular DNA synthesis company and they make it and send it back to you. But what's so special about DNA? You can make arbitrary shapes out of it. You can make two dimensional shapes, you can make three dimensional shapes, you can make curved shapes. All of these were made from the same scaffold. You're just changing the staple molecules. And they're extremely modular. You can make two dimensional and three dimensional shapes. They are all identical to each other. So uh, you know exactly what is the size of these structures. The yield is close to 100%. Uh, you can make this by biology. So at about approximately $300, $300, you can make a gram of origami and that's enough to cover uh, multiple football fields. Uh, uh, so so, so, so it's, you can make this at scale. You can crystallize these structures. You can design design it just like how Ned talked about crystallizing just DNA structures. DNA origami can be crystallized as well to make like extend lattices in 2D or 3D, uh, excuse me. Uh, and uh, you can make it, uh, modify it so that it's structurally stable up to 100C boiling water in arbitrary buffer or ionic conditions. And the quality that I like about DNA origami is its quality as a molecular breadboard. So remember this map of the DNA origami. So what you have done is every single part, when you're designing an origami, after you've designed it, when you are buying these different components, you will uh, send it off for, uh, to a particular uh, DNA vendor and they'll give you back a bunch of plates, like plates of DNA, but in which each location on that plate represents a physical location on your map. And, uh, uh, and when you mix it all together and heat it up and cool it down, you form the origami. And the next day you decide, I wanna put just three molecules, three molecules in the inner vertex. Just a note, uh, the edge of this particular origami is 127. The inner vertex is about 29 nanometers. So next day you decide, I wanna put three molecules exactly 
on the inner vertex separated by 29 nanometers, you don't need to redesign the whole thing. All you need to do is find out what these locations are, what these particular molecules are in your map, and then change it such that it has a short section, like it has a tail that can capture whatever it is that you want. So it looks like this, and you have, uh, just like uh, by just DNA uh, hybridization, if you have a tail that is poly T, so you have a section of TTT, you can actually have, uh, uh, you always can make, you, you can be sure that another DNA molecule that is AAA, it will bind there. So you can take this molecule, this AAA molecule and attach, a, attach, let's say a protein or a quantum dot or an atom or something onto it, and you mix it together, they go and bind there. So it becomes a very modular way to arrange other nanomaterials. So, and then you are left with a, another uh, origami wherein you have just three molecules exactly sitting where you want. Now, what does this remind you of? This reminds you of an electric, and, and, and just a pointer, every single end is about five nanometers away from every other end. So this reminds you of these kind of Arduino, kind of these kind of uh, breadboards in which you can put uh, uh, resistors and transistors and construct a, a, a abstract uh, any, uh, uh, any uh, electronic circuit that you want. But rather than actually doing it with electronic uh, components, this origami allows you to do it with molecular components. You can attach arbitrary structures wherever you want on this kind of breadboard. And, and then what you do with it is up to your imagination. And this idea has been taken for the last 10 years since origami or 15 years since origami was invented and people have been doing this. You can put in carbon nanotubes over on the top left, people with quantum dots and uh, nanoparticles put uh, conductive polymers, make quantum dot in a particular shape or biological molecules on the top right is personally one of the best examples of like precise uh, biological device created by this technique. It's a little caliper wherein you have two nucleosomes. So these are molecules that are used to package DNA in your body. The, uh, this was from Hendrik Dietz's lab over at uh, TU Munich. He made this little caliper and he can move these two molecules, these two particular protein molecules at a half an angstrong step and just for uh, reference, half an angstrom is basically half the radius of a hydrogen, mole hydrogen atom. He can move it at that resolution and study the interaction between these two proteins. So, so it's just to kind of give you the, the scope, how powerful the DNA origami technique is. And, uh, you know, but there is a problem here. There's a, because everything that we are talking about is in a solution. So even though you create these kind of uh, beautiful uh, electronic devices with two carbon nanotubes forming a nice little transistor and you write a paper in a really high impact pay journal, there is an ugly uh, part to this as well. Because when you zoom out, this is what it looks like. You don't know where these molecules are going to go. You don't know where these precise, precise devices are going to go. So you made a beautiful device that you can't see anywhere, that, that, that are not easy to create with any other technology, but you don't know where it's located. So even if you make a beautiful transistor, if you don't know where the transistor is located on a surface, you can't create a computer because you want to be able to remember when the first slide when I presented, the re, one of the powers of top-down fabrication is that once you know where something is located, you can make interconnects, you can turn it on, you can create logic out of it by connecting them together. You can't do this with this technique. So, so how do you solve this? And this is the problem that I've been spending the last decade trying to solve. And the way in which I solve this problem is by using chemically patterned surfaces, wherein I take a surface that is neutrally charged or it can be any other charge. You have two flavors of charges on a surface. You either have a neutral background and you have either positive or negative char charged uh, 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 sh shape location in the shape of the origami. Uh, and you create these kind of patterns by just using standard uh, lithography processes. This is, this is a technique known as self-assembled monolayer, wherein if you just take a surface and you put a, a particular molecule, it will form just a single layer of a particular uh, group, a, a particular chemical group. And these are standard in the CMOS, like a nanofabrication, molecular fabrication world. Uh, uh, so, so, so and, and the size of each of these features is about 100 nanometers. And the reason why this is important is because 100 nanometers are patterns very easily created in almost any clean room. And we'll talk about to towards the end, how you can do this even without clean room. And these 100 nanometers are in the shape of an origami such that, uh, and, and, and the way in which we typically like to create it is by using e-beam lithography. Again, we use e-beam lithography simply because it's e easily accessible. We can do this with standard tools 
uh, that are available in foundries. So every part of this is scalable. So we take a surface, we make it, uh, we, we put a self-assembled monolayer, put a polymer on top of it, use EVM to create patches that are in the shape of origami, and we make it negatively charged using oxygen plasma. And now why is it, and, and then it's important to understand how origami interacts with the surface. So if you have an origami that is negatively charged, because remember I told you a phosphate groups on the backbone, phosphates are typically negatively charged. So if you have a negatively charged surface, there is repulsion. If it's positively charged surface, there is attraction. When neutral, then it has a non-specific Van der Waal interactions. But in this repulsion setting, if you have a little bit of magnesium or like divalent cations, then there is like a weak interaction between them. And this is the regime that we like. We like two surfaces that are weakly, that are repulsive, but when you add uh, an, a particular divalent cation or a divalent cations, they start interacting with each other. And specifically what happens is the magnesium bridges the two negative surfaces. So you have methyl groups everywhere that's neutral where the origami can't interact. But you have anywhere that is negatively charged in the presence of magnesium, it will bridge it. Now, the reason why this is very interesting is that any given magnesium bridge, it's not stable. But once it once, the, but collectively, multiple magnesiums can bridge this large DNA origami onto the surface. So you can think of this, we can model it as like a self-assembly process in and of itself. So you have DNA origami in the shape of this blue triangle, and you have a surface patch with this red triangle. Initially, it will bind weakly with weak overlap, wherein you have it forms some magnesium bridges. But remember, I said that any given magnesium bridge is not stable. So it thermally fluctuates, wherein some of these bonds break, some of these bonds are, st are stable, and it basically fluctuates and basically gets knocked a little bit into the patch because it's slightly more stable. So it kind of acts as like an energy minimization process and it slots itself into that binding site. This is not just a theory. We can see this in AFM as well. So this is like a high-speed AFM of an origami interacting with the binding site. And not only that, we can actually start modeling these systems as well. You can say, what is the K on, K off of these systems? You can say, well, how fast they align. Uh, and if you can have a multiple binding events, things like that. Over here, you can see initially it gets stable there, but initially it dances around the patch. A second origami will come in very soon. It'll try to bind to the surface and then it gets knocked off. There's a second. Oh yeah, there you go. Second one came and then it knocked off and it reoriented itself. So very carefully when you actually do everything right, you end up getting surfaces like this, wherein you have single origami sitting exactly where you want on silicon dioxide surfaces. These are surfaces and substrates that form the basis of your computer, computer chips anyway. And we get extremely high yield. We can do this on multiple substrates. We have very good alignment. We can also do chemistry onto the surface. You, so if you give us an X, Y coordinate and tell me, I wanna have just a single chemical reaction at that location, we can do that with like precision of about 20 nanometers, plus or minus, maybe even uh, uh, smaller errors. And that's a capability that currently doesn't exist. Anyway, uh, uh, so, so after that we decided, okay, how do we show, how do we demonstrate the scalability? So what we did is we basically took this general idea and I'm not going to go into details of exactly what device we, we created or like a photonic crystal, but we created about 65,000 different photonic crystals. Each single pixel, we think of it as 65,000 different uh, devices that emits a certain frequency and a certain intensity. And it, the reason why it emits a certain intensity is because of the number of molecules sitting inside that device. This was just by, you know, this was a picture that I really like. It's painting that I really in, enjoy. So I decided, okay, if I, this is what I chose. So each single uh, a pixel that you see here, each light source that you see here is a photonic crystal cavity inside which you, have, you are putting just a single origami. And by changing the position of the origami and the number of origami inside this cavity, you can change the intensity. So if you want it to be really bright, then you want to be able to put up to seven different origamis at specific location. But if you want it to be dark, there'll be no origami. But if you wanted to have, let's say a unit of one seventh brightness, then you'll just put a single origami. So the reason why we did this is it's not an art piece. It is to demonstrate a capability. It is to demonstrate that once you create an optical device, you can give it a property based upon how many molecules you put there. It is to demonstrate that we have the power to put a molecule exactly where you want and do it using processes by which you create normal, optical or normal microelectro devices. So this is the first instance of deterministic integration of mo in molecules with devices. 
So once we got to this point, we were like, is it enough to control just the position? Like, it looks good. It looks like a good, 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 good uh, a bunch of figures. And we have, we do this very reproducibly on mass large scale, but it's not enough. It's not enough because if you look at it carefully, since the origami itself has uh, is is a symmetric structure, it has up down symmetry. Remember, it's a it's a it's a thin two dimensional structure, and it is a symmetric or uh, three fold symmetry, which means that what looks like a single binding uh, uh, looks like uh, uh, looks like looks like actually just a sec. I'm good. Uh, so what looks like a single binding is in reality one of six uh, uh, cases. So you can have three-fold symmetry. You can have it in any of the three orientations, or it can be flipped and be in one of three orientations. What that means is that if you design a structure to look like this, if you want, if you were to have a symmetry-breaking feature on each of the origami, this is what it actually looks like because you will not be able to actually figure out what is which direction any of the origami is going to go and bind on the surface. So it's important to break the symmetry. So we need to have, if you want to orient something or if you want to position a molecule, you need to have absolute orientation. So you need to basically do this with a asymmetric origami. In this particular case, it's like an asymmetric right triangle. So the big question is, how do you do this? There are two challenges. Remember, this is actually a two-dimensional particle, which means that it has up, you need to break the up-down symmetry and you need to break the in-plane symmetry. So the first challenge of up-down symmetry is if you take an origami, you have a right-handed face and a left-handed face. Think of it as an asymmetric right triangle. If you have a right-handed face and you have a left-handed face, you have two different faces to this. And so how do you actually control that? Since it has the same phosphate backbone, the probability of each of the face binding is identical. There is no reason why it should have an asymmetry. However, remember that we have arbitrary control over the position uh, of, the, uh, of, the, of the DNA molecule. So we can make sure that there is polymers only on one face of the origami. So I can choose the face of the origami, whether the right-handed side or the left-handed face, and I can put a polymer on top of it. I can put polymers on top of it, which means that entropically, it's more difficult to stabilize the polymers underneath than it is to have in a position, uh, than if the polymers were uh, pointing out upwards, which means that if the, the polymer, uh, the side with the polymer will basically face upwards. And this is the theory at least. And when we started doing the experiments, that's exactly what we saw. If we completely uh, cover one of the face with a polymer, uh, that face points upwards. And if we cover the other face with the same polymer, that face lines up. And then, no, that's as good as breaking up down symmetry. We have, we have essentially, this is proving that we can break up down symmetry. We did a whole bunch of analysis on figuring out how this happens and, uh, you know, how, what is the rate at which it changes, all of that. And, uh, 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 and, 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 and that was all, you know, clearly understandable. Then the question becomes, how do you break the in-plane symmetry? What do I mean by this? So once we broke the up-down symmetry, we were like very happy. This means that this will work great. So we decided to basically make a surface wherein you had binding site and you have the origami. So you had the right-handed origami, made sure that it will go, it's gonna bind only right face upwards, made a binding site that matches, did the experiment, and this is what it looked like, didn't work. So, so we, were like, you know, we, look, we stared at this result for a while, we didn't understand it. But when we did some analysis, we realized that any single binding event always fell into one of six cases. So what you have seen here is this is like an average of all the bindings, single binding that falls in this particular phase or in this particular mode. So it always forms in one of these six, six positions, six possibilities. And this is very interesting. So we decided to actually write a small little simulations to this to kind of explain this. So if you have a symmetric origami and a symmetric symmetric binding site that is in blue and an origami that is red, you know, it binds partially with partial overlap. And then by thermal fluctuation, it increases the area of overlap, which means that the energy minimization process. So as the area of overlap increases the energy, it's like an inversion of the energy landscape. So it, it, uh, it smoothly increases, it smoothly falls into this kind of lock position. So think of it as like an energy curve. It's smoothly, the energy minimization is a smooth transition. However, if you look at the asymmetric structure, you start realizing that it starts somewhere 
let it repeat okay it starts somewhere and it it increases the area of overlap it constant which means energy is reducing free energy is reducing 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 and it gets into a plateau because it gets into a plateau where no matter what wiggle how much it wiggles it doesn't gain any energy it, it the free energy doesn't change which means that it's a trap it's an energetic trap so so as it's going through this energy minimization process it can get into traps and then what we did is we we quant we did these simulations multiple times and figured out what are the probabilities of falling into a particular trap and then we quantified it and as it turns out we can predict exactly what the traps are we can predict what, if you give us two shapes we can predict how those how these molecules are going to interact with each other how the binding site will interact with the origami now what does this tell us it tells us that we understand how the process works because if we didn't understand it we couldn't predict it so we know how this kind of origami interacts with the surface you have a binding site of a particular shape and an origami of a particular shape we know exactly how they are going to interact with each other and using this we ask the question can we make a shape that is asymmetric and always have a smooth energetic minima into a single position because that that way it is asymmetric which means that you have broken the symmetry and you are making sure that there are no kinetic traps and as it turns out these kind of asymmetric donuts meets the uh, uh, criteria perfectly so the in, and we did a whole bunch of simulations wherein it looks like you know what happens is it wiggles around initially the centers align and after the centers align it twists and locks itself into place so under all conditions it will work and we can also theoretically explain why prove that these shapes there is an entire class of shapes that behaves this way uh and then we did the experiment so this is a case wherein you have an origami and you have a binding site the binding site doesn't have the, this uh, symmetry breaking feature but the origami has the symmetry breaking feature and then we took all the single binding events and averaged it and it looks like a donut what does the donut say the donut means that there is no preferential direction to the origami binding however over if you do the experiment wherein the origami and the binding sites are both have the uh, symmetry breaking feature then you end up seeing all the origamis for, for lining up and pointing in the direction that you want and the reason why here i mean if you are a careful observer you will basically say why is this a square and why this a circle the symmetry breaking that is just a uh, you know artifact in the sense that it's easier to make sharp features on origami whereas making sharp features on a binding site is very difficult you need to remember that these are the symmetry breaking features about 30 nanometers so making 30 nanometer features with very sharp edges is very difficult and the placement yield is greater than 99% the alignment error is about 4 degrees and this is an absolute alignment what that means is if you get a particular molecule there it is absolutely it's perfectly if you you can give me a direction or like in, with an absolute coordinate and give me an xy location and i can put a molecule a single molecule there with greater than 99% yield plus or minus error of let's about 10 5 to 10 nanometers and orientational error of plus or minus 4 degrees so you can control all the different free parameters of a particular molecule on a surface and we can do this on on a full wafer using processes that are used to and scalable and uh, to prove this we went we went and we, we we started having fun with this so the one of the experiments that we had was basically making what we call as a dna polymerometer wherein we have we created this structure with 12 we 12 um, arms a wheel with 12 arms wherein each arm has got origamis such that if you put a molecule they are oriented in the direction of the arm so every arm has got origamis carrying molecules pointing in a particular direction and when you excite it with unpolarized light all of them light up however when you excite them with a polarized light only the molecules that aligns with the excitation polarization will light up and when you rotate the polarization only the molecules that a uh, that interact with those particular molecules that are aligned with it light up and we can do this i mean and this was done under oil so and fluid so that's why you see like junk kind of floating around and then we were like you know can we actually do a little bit more fun with this okay this was about 3500 individual dna molecules and uh, you know and and they all emit uh, 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 i mean they, in which you know they they the 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 um, you know 
35 different 3500 different origamis were put and each origami carries uh, light emitting molecules that are oriented uh, in a particular way and then we decided to have fun with it uh, uh, or okay i don't i don't have those figures i mean i we created a bunch of star wars pictures but i'm going to i mean just for the sake of time i'll just ignore it we can talk i might show it later so then what we did is we repeated the experiment with the same the, the same device that we created the starry night but now rather than changing the position of molecules we changed the orientation so we had a single origami sitting in the middle of the photonic crystal cavity and we rotated its orientation so we have a molecule we have multiple copies of the same device all of them have the same number of molecules sitting sitting at the exact same location and we are merely changing the orientation of the molecules. And the reason why this is interesting is because inside the photonic crystal cavity, you have a distribution of electric field. The electric field distribution looks sort of like this. There are two parts to it. You have an EY component, uh, electrical components, and you have EX component. Obviously, if you have a molecule sitting in the middle, it's going to interact only with the EY component, which means that is because you have the dipole moment and electric field, and it's a cross product. Uh, it's a dot product between them, which means that it has a cosine, co cosine theta interaction between them. So when they are oriented with each other, when they are aligned with each other, this, this, this value is maximized. This dot product is maximized, whereas when it is out of, uh, uh, when it is orthogonal, this particular product is going to be minimized, which means that it goes to zero. Zero. So, so we did a whole bunch of these uh, uh, cavities. In the middle, you have them orthogonal, wherein it, this is how the AFM looks like. You have the cavity, you have the origami pointing in the uh, X direction. And on the edges, you have the origamis such that it is pointing in the Y direction. So you have maximum interaction between the light molecules in the on the origami and the cavity on the edges, while minimum in the in the in the middle the reason why it is not zero is because the the dipole orientation is not perfectly planar it has out of plane components which is why you have like some light still coming out of it and when you compare it against the experiment and the simulation it matches almost identically so this is like the first instance wherein you are able to control independently the position and orientation of molecules and at the same time integrate that with like optical devices or potentially even electronic devices the reason why we didn't do electronic devices was purely because uh, we didn't have uh, you know i i my background is optical physics so i just decided to do there i mean electronic devices we will go into it soon uh, uh, but uh, you know it's still work in progress so once we reached this position, we were left with another question. Can we actually do this whole process without getting into the clean room? Because there are a lot of reasons why you would want to position individual molecules at specific locations, but you don't want to spend the money to go into the clean room and do all of that. So we wanted to democratize the whole process and also Personally, I am interested in self-assembly. How far can self-assembly be pushed? So we decided to actually create these molecule arrays, single molecule arrays for less than a dollar. And the idea was to take a whole bunch of microbeads. So you take a substrate, you put microbeads. So these are just polystyrene beads. They, you can get like essentially liters of these for like a few dollars. Uh, and if you put them together in the right condition, right surfactant conditions and you evaporated you and you end up getting a self-assembled monolayer of these polymers so these these not these beads and from their side it looks sort of like this and what is interesting over here is the the region that is occluded by these particular beads depend upon the size of the bead so depending a larger bead and a smaller bead a small bead will will shadow only a very small region whereas if you have a big bead it will shadow a larger region and the distance between center to center distance is determined by the size of the bead. So, and so what you can do is you can take a surface, put the beads onto the surface and do a self-assembled monolayer. So you can actually, these, the, the beads will shadow, which the, wherever the beads are touching the substrate, nothing happens, but everywhere else you can put a passivating layer. So you can make the surface, you can start with a surface that origami is sticky to, and then basically passivate all the regions other than where the beads were bound. So you end up patterning the surface without actually using any clean room technique. 
and then you flow in the origami and you're left with single origami sitting exactly where you want and you can i mean and and when you zoom into the surface zoom into a, a uh, into one of these locations you have just you know origami just you can see single origami sitting or you don't have orientational control but that's a different matter and uh, the errors here is depending upon you know uh, it's somewhere between 70 and 85% again the reason why you have lower yields here is because the process itself is completely by self assembly there are errors the chances of errors are a lot more here but either way the cost of this whole process is less than a dollar and you can get surfaces like this where in each this is an optical experiment where every single position has got a single molecule this we have just we have just you know aggregated we have just it's basically an average of the entire experiment wherein we have somewhere in the vicinity of 10 to the 4 molecules being simultaneously observed over a single field of view this is fundamentally impossible using any other technique like you and we do it for less than a dollar and the reason why we were doing that is to open up single molecule biophysics experiments to 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 make it easy for anyone to do single molecule biophysics experiments so you don't need to go into the clean room you don't need to spend a lot of money doing these patterning and you can get a lot of data and then what you do with the data is up to you then uh, depending upon the, how the experiments are set up so so in summary uh, you know we i know i showed you data on how you can position molecules on arbitrary substrates using this origami process how this is scalable you can couple it to uh, 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 wafer scale integration tools uh, and then i talked about how we can control orientation so this is the star wars picture that i was talking about wherein we made two different pictures where you have darth vader and yoda they are both basically in the same region but if you put it in one polarization you will see darth vader and when you put it in the other uh, orientation you end up seeing yoda so um, but you know that's a long story as to why this this didn't show up in the paper and uh, you know that's that's a, that's a completely different story and then we also are starting to do this whole process using completely without clean room free uh, without ever getting into the clean room so i'm going to i'm going to i'm going to pause there uh, and uh, you know i'm going to pause there and basically take any questions that you might have uh, so and and the pre people who are all part of this uh, it's is basically i was in paul's lab you know all these guys who are funding us uh, uh, and uh, andre and evan were involved in the starry night paper uh, david and Scra chris uh, were very helpful in trying to get the proving that these kind of donuts asymmetric donuts help us orient the molecules harry and anya basically were involved in the in the orientation experiments rishabh and rizal were helpful in uh, the clean room free experiments and Jamie and uh, Byungjin, they are at Caltech. They were working uh, alongside uh, helping with some of these experiments over the time. And this, these guys, guys who, uh, you know, funding agencies were generous with us over the last many years. And this was like MIT and Caltech uh, have been, you know, been gracious with their facilities and, you know, giving us a chance. So, yeah, I would love to take any questions. Well, thank you very much. It's a very fascinating uh, talk. And uh, now is your chance to ask question. Okay, why are people thinking of question? I mean, oh, okay, uh, I think Hang is... Uh... Okay, so yeah, this is a very interesting, you know, and what's the near term application for this? Ah, so the near-term applications, uh, let me see if I have the, uh, I might have some, oh, okay. Um, the figure, let me, let me reshare it. So the near-term application for this is mostly in sensing of different kinds. Specifically, we are creating, uh, there are different, uh, so, so for instance, if you want to be creating, let's say, uh, uh, like we are, so we have a startup uh, that wherein we are trying to do uh, protein measurements. We want to be able to take, uh, make a single surface uh, or a single array wherein we want to be able to measure a single molecules cap, like uh, count 
proteins and small molecules that are there in, uh, in, in biological samples. So that's a near-term application. Another near-term application is basically trying to, from a, from a non-biological setting, it's going to be on doing things like quantum information processing, where you require single light emitters or a single uh, quantum um, uh, processing uh, element, sort of like, let's say, a single uh, point defect uh, in crystal, uh, in a silicon crystal. Uh, you know, how do we actually manipulate single quanta of, uh, you know, uh, either a light emitter or an optical, uh, yeah, like an uh, electronic uh, defect? All of those requires point modifications or like single unit modifications at specific locations. All of those areas we can uh, have immediate applications. More longer term, mm -hmm. this has applications in like trying to make like patterning and all these other things. But for right. the time being, anywhere that you require single molecular interactions, the mm -hmm. technique allows, technique is apl applicable. Oh, okay. All right, yeah, that's, that's good. A very interesting technique. Yeah. Okay. Any other question? So I'm just have a quick question about, you mentioned that, that um, the, the, the origami structures can be stable at 100 degrees Celsius. So what trick do we use to make sure that they are not dissociate at high temperature? Oh, uh, so this is, this is the beautiful work by um, uh, Hendrik and uh, Hendrik Dietz's lab at uh, TU Munich. Uh, so the way in which he does it, he puts uh, 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 poly T. So he has uh, this TT optical TT dimerization. So if you have two thiamines that are adjacent to each other, if you hit it with like about 306 nanometers UV uh, irradiation, the TT, both the thiamines will dimerize and form uh, a particular, it basically covalently links. So what he has done is he has taken like small TT overhangs onto every single staple. This is a published paper. It's a, it's a science paper from I think last year or the year before that. Um, uh, he took the, all of these uh, uh, t, uh, like staples and he has like t, uh, po, like a two T modifications at the edges, and he hits it with UV, 306 nanometers, and it just basically crystallize it. It covalently links the entire structure, and that is not going to uh, dry up. I think the first author is first author of that paper is Thomas something. Okay. So it's, uh, first author is Thomas. Last author, all author is Hendrik Dietz. It's a science or a science advanced paper. Gotcha. It's pretty neat. Like, so then for, for your photonic uh, system, and let's say you create um, um, a wheel with different uh, polarization uh, air orientation, does it mean that you have to create a lot of different origami? No, you don't. It's it's the same origami. It's the same origami. And the reason why each of them light up differently is because their orientation of the molecule is different. So a good way to think about this is sort of like, so you can think of a dye molecule. A good way to think about a dye molecule is uh, you can think of it sort of as like a pendulum. So if you were to think of it as a pen, so, so a good way to think about it, let me actually just, uh, let me one second. Uh, so, so let me share it again. Okay, so this is what the origami looks like. And in there, uh, uh, what we have done is we have taken an integrating dye, it's a toto dye. It basically integrates into the DNA, stra DNA strand. And what that means is every, since all the helices are pointing or, or in the same direction, and the integrating dye is, gone in, is on the orthogonal plane. So if the, if the, if the dye is going in one direction, the, the dipoles are all in the plane orthogonal to it, which means that the net dipole of all the molecules in here is going to be in a plane orthogonal to that of the helices. What that means is if you were to take a dye and excite it with, an excite, with a particular beam and get an emission, and it has a certain dipole orientation, the electric field, when the electric field is uh, uh, aligned to it, it has maximum interaction. And when it is orthogonal, it is minimum interaction. This is very similar to uh, uh, pendulums. So if you have two pendulums and if you put force into it, when you put force, both of them will excite, get excited. But if you have one pendulum that is orthogonal to other, and when you put force, only the pendulum that is orthogonal, uh, that aligned with the force will uh, oscillate. The other one won't. What that means is that in this setting, when you excite it with a light, uh, when you excite it with light on these arms, on the left arm, on these arms, you can see my cursor, right? 
-hmm. Yes. So only the only the only the uh, uh, molecules in this particular uh, uh, we uh, arm and this particular arm are aligned with the polarization, which means that maximum energy gets excited. It gets maximum energy in into the dye and maximum emission. Whereas on these these uh, particular arms, since they are orthogonal, it doesn't excite it at all. However, when you rotate the polarization and it gets to the middle, now all of a sudden it can actually uh, uh, those can interact with it. So as you rotate it, you're changing which molecule gets excited by the light. So you're keeping the same molecule, you're just rotating it. Ah, I see, gotcha. That's pretty neat. So mainly you have one structure, but it's because you control the orientation of the uh, 360 degree of that uh, donut origami. Then Correct. by rotating the, uh, the polarization light, you could be able just to excite them with different intensities. Ex exactly, exactly, exactly. Pretty neat. Huh. Okay. So now um, you also mentioned about the um, um, the case where you try to break the symmetry, right? And then yep. you, you notice that um, that a particular structure you have six different position. That yeah. So that that's that is that is uh, so that is partly uh, I think that what you're talking about is this one, this figure, I suppose. Right. Oh, it, or is is not, this no, the one it, that? Not that the, the one with the uh, the non symmetry. The I see, I uh, see. The, I think it's this one. Yes, this one. Okay. So so wh why six? Like how, how not do you six. It, it, it's it's just a, it's just it's just the shape. If you change the shape, you will have other kinetic traps. It's just so how it's just a it's just a fluke that uh, uh, this particular shape had six six kinetic traps. If you change the shape to some other shape, some other asymmetric shape, you will have other kinetic traps. I see. Because I'm I'm so, I'm in I'm looking to a, a, a binding between Shoptavin and Biotin. Okay. So Tavin they have four binding sites. Yep. And if you attach a biotin with DNA label, then they have also have the preferential binding. And they, they and then they, they could form the obtuse angle and they could form a linear angle. They can basically you can control the angle how the the bio Correct. and I just wanted to if we could control that, like sometimes I want to only have so to just only two biotin. And I want to ignore the other two so that I can form the a chain line structure. I I I I I I, I don't know the exact uh, uh, interaction. I, I I don't I don't know off the top of my head how uh, the like exact binding and uh, you know what what are the sizes involved but i suppose there might be ways i mean we can talk offline uh, yeah. about how that can be achieved gotcha and and could you also comment about how the the, the, the scanning probe tips affect the position of the let's say because you, you mentioned that they are not the, the mechanism when it binds to the, the, the unless you hit it very very strongly it's not going to affect it much we can, uh, I mean, unless you, unless it, it depends upon, it depends upon the exact uh, uh, um, scanning conditions, but you can scan it in a, you can be very soft about it. You can be in a condition wherein it doesn't affect it at all. I see. So independent yep. of the, 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 the external force from the tip, the orientation yep. happen naturally. Yes. Yes. Okay. Great. Oh, that's pretty awesome. Okay. Any any other question from audience? Okay. If not, uh, let's thanks our speaker again and uh, yeah. We, uh, so happy <laughs> that you could give us an awesome seminar. Yeah. Okay. And, yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean. Um, for those who are not who is shy that you want to ask the question after the talk, I'll, I'll hang around. If you have any question, perhaps the, the, the speaker could hang around for another five minutes. Um, sure. If not, um, we could end the meeting at, uh, let's say, 5.10. Okay. Okay. That sounds, that sounds good. Thank you. Thank you.